Okay. We'll see if we get a yeah. chance over the break, maybe. Okay, so welcome everybody to one of the longest titles of the program, Linking Hydrological and Biogeochemical uh, Processes in Disturbed Ecosystems, Implications for Watershed Management. So our first presenter today will be Vaughan Mangle, and he's going to present on forest harvesting impacts on chemical composition of dissolved organic matter in boreal streams. And with that, stay on time. Let's take it away, Vaughan. Thanks a lot, Dave. Um, welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. And uh, yeah, as Dave mentioned, today I'll be talking to you about some of the forest harvesting impacts on and how this influences the chemical composition of dissolved organic matter in some of the boreal streams that we're sampling in Northern Ontario. So these boreal forests in Northern Ontario are currently being actively harvested uh, as part of softwood craft pulp that is used for a variety of consumer products. And these harvesting practices range from clear cutting the entire forest to selective cutting. Um, certain trees. In this process, heavy machinery, um, it, heavy machinery including skitters, are used to log uh, uh, logs through the forest, and these leave skitter trails and result in severe soil compaction and destruction and devastation across the landscape. Currently, best management practices exist to minimize some of these implications on forest harvesting across the landscape. However, little is known around the biogeochemical changes that forest harvesting actually applies to these boreal regions. My work focus spe focuses specifically on dissolved organic matter. So carbon from terrestrial sources, precipitation, and uh, dissolved organic matter, or DOM, has important geochemical and biogeochemical implications. So the first of which, it, uh, it can function as a microbial nutrient source. So Small and electron-rich carbon substrates are consumed by microorganisms in, in aquatic systems that link abiotic carbon to biotic cycles. As a byproduct of this microbial metabolism, carbon in, is released in the form of gaseous CO2 or methane that further contributes to greenhouse gas production and concentration. So this dissolved organic matter that's actually exported to aquatic systems is a vital microbial nutrient source. Secondly, in these aquatic systems, dissolved organic matter, mainly in the form of the aromatic fractions, can actually attenuate some UV light and mitigate uh, harmful UV exposure to organisms in shallow streams especially. Dissolved organic matter is very complex and, it's, and the variety of functional groups within DOM can have important roles for transporting and mobilizing inorganic contaminants, uh, such as metals like cadmium, lead, and mercury. Now, as previously mentioned, dissolved organic matter is extremely complex, and it's made up of a mixture of organic molecules across terrestrial and aquatic spheres. So here's just a rough schematic that um, shows that dissolved organic matter has uh, biopolymers, humic substances, uh, saccharide-based building blocks, protein-like material, fulvic material, uh, low molecular weight, high molecular weight neutrals. So a lot of traditional kind of techniques characterize the concentration of dissolved organic matter, or in this case, dissolved organic carbon, but there's a lot more to, to the picture. It's extremely complex and heterogeneous, and the composition of dissolved organic matter is extremely important for the eco, ecological and microbial functions in aquatic systems. Now, how does this relate to forest harvesting and how dissolved organic matter is exported? So, Normally, as I mentioned, precipitation occurs, and from that precipitation, soil organic carbon is naturally released from terrestrial sources into aquatic systems. However, in the process of forest harvesting, the soil is compacted and squeezes a lot of the carbon from the landscape into these systems. In addition, there are fresh and a surplus of, of carbon that comes in the form of leaf litter leachates from actively uh, cut down trees and excess woody material and debris that is left all along the landscape. So as a result, we, we end up seeing carbon that would have normally been mobilized to aquatic systems much slower, uh, immediately entering in, the form, in aquatic systems through a pulse of organic material. So this leads us to our question as to how forest harvesting impacts the, the chemistry and the chemical composition of what, this carbon that is being mobilized into these small boreal streams. 
And we also wondered if or how the quantity of, of DOM in these streams changes before or after forest harvesting. We, we hypothesized from this that the amount of dissolved organic carbon in streams would increase due to the increased abundance of, um, of carbon material that's present and that uh, the composition in forest streams will shift to, to larger dissolved organic matter substrates and a bigger input of plant material. To evaluate this hypothesis, we sampled in the boreal watersheds in Northwestern Ontario in two distinct regions. So we, we sampled in the Dryden region here, and we also centered in the, uh, sampled in the center fire region here. We sampled a total of three watersheds in the Dryden region and three watersheds in the center fire region that um, were in the process of being harvested. So well, we sampled in late September and early October of 2019. And then again in 2021, after these, these sites have, were harvested, we chose to sample mainly in the fall as precipitation events are, are fairly common during these autumn months. And that is when we would see the largest pulse of carbon flushing from the terrestrial system into aquatic systems. We also have two reference sites, um, in this case, Dryden 1A and 1B in the Dryden region and the center fire reference one region here that uh, was not harvested in order to evaluate regional differences between uh, these different watersheds. From this, we collected total organic carbon samples and samples for high resolution mass spectrometry in the form of uh, Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance mass spectrometry to gain an idea of chem the chemical composition of dissolved organic matter. As I previously mentioned, the traditional way of evaluating carbon in a system is just to get a total organic carbon uh, concentration. However, there's a lot more to it than that. From the high resolution mass spectrometry technique, we're able to obtain a molecular fingerprint that is, that is fairly unique to that aquatic system in that period of time. And, and from this information, we're able to get an idea of different types of compound classes that fall within this total organic carbon pool. We're able to get molecular level data um, that provides insight as to whether or not that particular molecule falls within a protein class, a lipid class, carbohydrates, uh, if they're more polyphenolic or phenolic signatures, um, and how aromatic these molecules are. So really using this technique, we're able to uh, get in high detail and resolution the, the molecular fingerprint of this aquatic system to see really how it changes after land use impacts. The first thing that we looked at was the dissolved organic carbon concentrations before and after forest harvesting. So the, uh, the bar plots here in gray is post-harvest, the dissolved organic carbon concentrations in milligrams per liter, and orange is before harvesting. So in many of the treatment sites, both in center fire and dried in regions, uh, there's a significantly greater dissolved organic carbon concentration after forest harvesting occurred. In reference sites, um, it varied based on region, but the degree of variation uh, was significantly higher in these reference regions, and there was no significant difference pre and post harvest. So the first thing that we can evaluate here is that there are significantly greater carbon concentrations in these streams in the fall months uh, after forest harvesting occurs. From a chemical composition perspective, if we look at the spectra that we obtain from the high resolution mass spectrometry uh, data on the, on the left here for pre-harvest, we're able to see that there's kind of a normal distribution in peaks. And the, every single one of these peaks correlates to a unique organic carbon molecule. After we harvest, after the, the carbon was harvested, um, we were actually able to see a greater intensity of molecules that was present that didn't have as uniform of a shift. And this shift is called a Kendrick mass defect shift. And pretty much what that means is that as, as carbon molecules build upon each other, generally they add in CH2 subunits and that's how they normally elongate. The fact that we're seeing a deviation from this normal distribution of the carbon data suggests more unique molecule signatures are being added to the system uh, that, are, are, that aren't 
uh, relating to each other as much before we harvest here. In addition, uh, after uh, forest harvesting occurs, the distribution is skewed more towards the left-hand side for post-harvest. And this indicates that there's a greater abundance of low molecular weight material after for these forests are harvested. Using a Venn Kravlin diagram, we're able to look at this complex organic mixture to see how the chemistry of this water body is changing before and after harvesting. So before the forests are, are harvested, the chemical signature in these aquatic systems uh, generally follows this pattern where we see a high degree of highly unsaturated compounds, a relatively large signature of polyphenols, and a large signature of polycyclic aromatics, where blue circles indicate that those molecules are more abundant. Now, after we harvest, there is first off a, a less highly unsaturated compound and polyphenolic signature after these forests are cut down. So the, the abundance and, and diversity of molecules in this highly unsaturated region and the polycyclic aromatic region decreases. And what we're ended up with is a, a distinct shift in polyphenolic material. So there's a surplus of polyphenolic like carbon that's entering these systems after the forests are harvested. In addition, there's an overall notable reduction in the amount of oxygenated carbon that we're seeing here. So generally, if you look at before these streams are harvested, there's more material over on the right hand side on the of these plots, whereas that's rather absent uh, after harvesting. And that indicates that there's more hydrogenated material and lower oxygen content uh, after forests are harvested. From a regional scale, we looked at how these Dryden and Centerfire regions varied and their relative responsiveness to forest harvesting. So before these uh, systems were harvested, there was a high degree of similarity between all of the Dryden regions and all of the Centerfire regions here. And that's important because using this Bray Curtis dissimilarity measurement, this shows that the carbon is more or less related to its regionality. And there are regional trends between the types of carbon that we're seeing across these boreal systems. However, after harvesting, that regionality and clustering falls apart, and there a lot of homogenization occurs in the carbon that is irrespective of the regions that we're sampling. And these, no, these lack of significant differences in DOM composition tell us that um, after forests are harvested, the regionality aspect of the carbon in these systems is less influential. From this, using a non-metric multidimensional scaling uh, analysis, we we're able to see that the, the polyphenolic content, mainly in the Dryden and Centerfire regions, is what's driving the separation between the, the, the regions and the carbon after they're harvested. Whereas before these regions are harvested, there's a higher signature of highly unsaturated compounds. Um, and this kind of differentiation and shift between highly unsaturated compounds to a aquatic systems where polyphenolic content is greater, it seems to be what's driving the chemical changes in the carbon after forest harvesting. What we're seeing as well is that overall, the the reduction in oxygen um, heteroatoms present uh, causes an overall shift in the carbon and a condensation of DOM after forest harvesting. And what this means is that the presence of with the presence of oxygen being diminished after forest harvesting, um, we get a lot of carbon to carbon bonds that are denser and richer. And as a result, we have uh, larger and more recalcitrant molecules present in aquatic systems. This pulse of vascular plant-derived polyphenolic material that's depleted in oxygen can reduce in-stream processing of DOM. And these molecules are generally double bond or um, very, very close together. And as a result, can attenuate UV light, reducing, reducing oxygen penetration, uh, oxygen stratification, and overall heterotrophy of these systems. Well, this may that's, increase. That's 15. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. 
Yeah, I can, if you just have a 30 No seconds. problem. All right, good. This pulse of plant material coming into the system can lead to oxygen depletion and influence biogeochemical cycling of other contaminants. So I'd like to thank my, my co-authors, Plonk, Dr. Eric Emelson, uh, Rob Macrath, and Dr. Carl, Carl Mitchell, and all of my funding sources. Thank you. All right, so we'll save the questions for um, the break. Sounds good. Or if anyone has questions uh, for Vaughn in the meantime, feel free to send it in the comments. So to stay on schedule, we're gonna introduce our next speaker, Daniel Gregoire from the University of Waterloo, presenting his talk, A History of Eating Garbage and Getting Gas. Take it away when you're ready. Problem. So you should be able to see my desktop now, and I'm just gonna start the screen. So can you see the title slide? Good. All right, so good day, everybody. Um, today, I'm gonna to be presenting some of my research that's characterizing microbial communities that control the uh, uh, fate of methane in landfills. Sorry, I'm just making sure my microphone works properly here. All right, sorry about the technical difficulty. Jump back in here. All right, so I've included my name here. This is research I did with Dr. Laura Hug at the University of Waterloo, and it's about the looking at microbial communities in landfills. And so I'm going to start with a bit of background information on the concerns surrounding landfills and their production of methane and summarize some of the microbial pathways that are responsible for methane production and waste. I'm going to highlight some objectives of our study and how we went about characterizing microbial communities in a landfill. And I'm going to close with some final thoughts on how the insights we gain from microbial communities in landfills can help us manage waste in a more sustainable way in the future. So I want to set the stage by making you think about just how much garbage we produce as humans. In North America, it's estimated that we produce between two to four kilograms of waste a day. And at a global scale, recent estimates suggest that two billion tons of solid waste were produced in 2016. And those are 2016 numbers. What's more concerning is that that number is thought to grow to 3.5 billion tons by 2050. So that's a lot of garbage. Now, just over a third of that solid waste is landfills, is landfilled, and landfills are essential in how we manage waste in our municipalities. And one of the biggest environmental concerns tied to landfills is the production of greenhouse gases like methane. So globally, landfills produce between 60 to 70 million tons of methane a year and it makes them a significant contributor to the global climate crisis. To give you a bit of perspective, in a country like Canada, that's about 5% of our total methane emissions. Now, landfills are hot spots for methane because they contain a lot of food and paper waste that's rich in organic matter. So this kind of touches on what Bon was talking about a little bit with DOM. And this organic matter is degraded through microbial metabolic activity, where what's considered to be the final step of organic matter degradation is controlled by methanogens. Now, methanogens are a group of microbes that thrive in the absence of oxygen, and they can use inorganic or organic carbon to produce methane to produce energy. Now, in addition to methanogens, there are also methanotrophs that can limit methane emissions from methane oxidation, but today I'm only going to be focusing on methanogens in landfills. So landfills undergo five major biogeochemical transitions over their lifetime that are controlled by microbial metabolism. Phase one is the short-lived aerobic phase where microbes rapidly consume organic matter and oxygen to initiate waste degradation. Once that oxygen is gone, phase two starts. The microbes start breaking down cellulose containing material like paper. They produce a lot of carbon dioxide and they can stimulate fermentative microbes. Now fermentative microbes start producing organic acids which jumpstart phase three because they provide all this labile substrate for methanogenic microbes that start to rapidly produce methane. As those substrates are depleted, methane production starts to slow down in phase four of slow methanogenesis. And eventually methane concentrations can even decrease because oxygen can start getting back into the landfill. That works on two levels by inhibiting methanogens that are very sensitive to oxygen, but also stimulating methanotrophs that can use oxygen to consume methane. For perspective, that last phase can take almost 20 years to occur and what limited data is available to support it. So methanogenic metabolism plays a key role in controlling the chemistry of landfills. 
And the two best studied pathways for microbial methane production are the hydrogenotrophic and the acetoclastic pathway. The hydrogenotrophic pathway is shown here with the orange arrows, requires electrons from hydrogen to reduce carbon dioxide and produce a key metabolite called methyl coenzyme M. And what you need to know about that is it's the precursor to methane. Cells convert that precursor to methane using something called the methyl coenzyme M reductase enzymatic complex or the MCR enzyme complex. And what you need to know about that is the MCRA gene is used as a biomarker to identify methanogens. The acetoclastic pathway works by converting acetate to the central metabolite acetyl-CoA, as shown by the blue arrows. And then that can be onboarded into the same machinery used by hydrogenotrophic methanogens. Methane can also be produced from methyl bearing molecules like methanol, amines, and thiols through pathways shown here in brown. And some microbes can even reverse the entire pathway to oxidize methane in the absence of oxygen, as shown by the green arrows. And so previous work on methanogens in landfills has largely relied on amplicon sequencing approaches. And that's where a single gene, like the MCRA gene, is sequenced. And the genetic variation in those sequences is used to identify which methanogens are present in solid waste. But the major limitation of that type of approach is that it doesn't provide metabolic insights into what pathways are present and possibly contributing to methane production. And so that's where metagenomic sequencing addresses many of these limitations. By sequencing all of the whole community DNA in a microbial community, you can assemble genomes, identify the metabolic pathways that are present, and importantly, you can connect them to the observations you're making about environmental chemistry in a given habitat. And so in this study, we coupled metagenomic sequencing to geochemical analysis to provide an unprecedented historical perspective on methane cycling in a landfill. We sampled a sanitary landfill in the northeastern United States that had six landfill cells, and they're going to be lettered A through F for the remainder of the presentation. And what's really cool about this site is those cells have operated in succession over the last 36 years. And so we sampled leachate across all of these aging landfill cells, and our goal was to validate whether our characterization of the methanogenic community aligned with how we would classify each landfill cell in that landfill life cycle based solely on geochemistry. And so this diagram summarizes the 36 years of geochemical records we were provided by site owners and where we classified each landfill cell in the life cycle. Landfill cells A and B started receiving waste 36 years ago and are thought to be in phase five because methane is slow here and there's oxygen present. Location C started receiving waste 31 years ago and is thought to be in a phase four of slow methane production. Cell D was sampled at two different locations that started receiving waste about two years apart, but the geochemistry here is very consistent and supportive of slow methane production happening here as part of phase four. Landfill cell E is 20 years old and has been the longest in consecutive operation. This area had a lot of methane being produced and that suggests it's, being in, it's in phase three of fast methane production. And finally, we have cell F, which is five years old. And cell F was sampled at two locations as well. Based on its geochemistry, it seems to be moving out of phase two because there's some small carbon sources still present here and initiating fast methane production as part of phase three. And so with that geochemical context, we reconstructed genomes and identified the metabolic pathways that are present to compare methanogen dynamics in old versus new waste. And so here I'm showing data for our methanogen community from the oldest parts of the landfill, cells A and B. I'll walk you through this figure. On the left-hand y-axis, you have the phylum and family names of the different methanogen populations we were able to sequence. To the right of that is a heat map showing the completion of metabolic pathways, where a darker color means that a metabolic pathway is more complete. Here I've trimmed the data down to only show you hydrogenotrophic methanogenesis, as well as the acetyl-CoA synthase enzyme. And what you need to know about that is it's essential to acetoclastic methanogens. To the further right of that, you have gene presence absence data where we were able to detect whether biomarker genes showing that a microbe could access a potential substrate to produce methane were present, and those are marked by green squares. And on the furthest right-hand y-axis is our genomic coverage data. So that's how many times on average a genome was sequenced in our data set, and we're using that as a proxy for abundance. The most abundant methanogens are placed at the top of each facet, the limit of the x-axis has actually been scaled to the most abundant genome in the entire community. And for additional reference, I'm showing the mean coverage by a solid line 
and the median coverage by a dash line. But all this is to give you a sense of how abundant methanogens are in our data set or in this landfill. And so the takeaway from this is that methanogens have quite restricted metabolism. They're really only able to use hydrogen trophic or acetoclastic pathways. And on top of that, they're not really abundant or diverse. But that really aligns with the geochemistry of these locations where oxygen is probably making it difficult for these methanogens to survive. And there's very limited carbon that's left over to support methane production. But if we jump to the newest part of the landfill, like cell F1, it's quite a different story. We see here that putative methanogens are more abundant, diverse, and way more metabolically versatile. Whereas the community at cells A and B could only support hydrogenotrophic and acetoclastic methanogens, if you look at the gene presence absence data, you can see that cell F has methanogens capable of using methanol and even amine bearing molecules to produce methane. There are some families like the methanosarcinaceae that carry the machinery for multiple pathways. And this aligns with the frequent detection of this family in amplicon sequencing studies of landfills over the last 20 years. And so they're probably important players in methane production at the global scale. These results make sense when you consider that this landfill is exiting phase two of fermentative acid production, and it's moving into a phase of rapid methane production. And so it's not surprising to see a thriving community of methanogens here. And so these two examples highlight a broader trend we observed across the landfill, where methanogens were more abundant, diverse, and metabolically versatile in newer waste compared to older waste. Our characterization of the methanogen community mostly aligned with our predictions, but we did have some observations that suggested the microbial community is sensitive to short-term changes in their environmental chemistry that are important to consider in landfill life cycle models. An example of this is cell E. We originally classified it as being in phase three of rapid methane production, and I haven't shown the data here for the sake of brevity, but this microbial community looked like waste that was 10 to 15 years older, where methane production has really slowed down. And so these findings show the importance of really considering that biological dimension, where the sensitivity of microbes to their environmental chemistry and how fast they respond to changes in it may complement these larger scale geochemical monitoring programs so we can anticipate how landfill performance is going to change as waste ages. And so ultimately, our study provides a glimpse into the succession that occurs in the methanogenic community over the life of the landfill. The functional insights that we gain by using metagenomic approaches can help us predict how methane emissions will fluctuate over time and as the composition of waste changes. And so we can build those in on those insights to try and optimize waste diversion programs that are designed to limit greenhouse gas emissions, or even increase the efficiency at which we capture methane, all by considering what's in our garbage and the microbes that are in the landfills. But developing those strategies is going to require that we characterize a lot more microbial communities across many geographically distinct landfills, because we need to identify the key players that ultimately control the fate in what amounts to a very heterogeneous contaminated habitat. And so with that, I want to thank you all for your attention. I'd like to thank the funding agencies and industry partners that have supported this work. If you'd like to learn more, I'm happy to answer questions now or offline. I've provided my contact info and Twitter here. And I'm going to take this opportunity to say I'm starting my lab at Carleton in July. And so if you like this type of work and want to do more work connecting microbial communities to biogeochemistry, please feel free to reach out. Thanks. Thanks for that talk. It was really interesting. I love the plug at the end as well. Your work sounds <laughs> awesome. <laughs> if Thank anyone you. has questions, feel free to pop them in the chat or just to unmute yourselves. I'll ask her a quick question, Dan. Um, really yeah. interesting work. Great stuff. Um, do you think there's ways to build off this information and and like maybe even apply different microbial communities at different times to try and potentially reduce um emissions of methanogen uh, sorry <laughs> of methane from these waste treatments like potentially in topsoils or and you know there's a big picture question um Yes. And one facet of this story I didn't show was that we did all this for the methanotrophs as well. And so there is work looking at how to stimulate methanotrophs and cover soil 
um, to oxidize high levels of methane or even atmospheric levels of methane. There's certain guilds that do better at atmospheric levels. And one really cool finding we had here that again, I didn't show for the sake of brevity is we found some of those microbes that can oxidize methane in the absence of oxygen. And so a big pitch for our research is let's work on those ones more. Let's get it at the source. And how can you stimulate them with specific metabolites? Is there a certain type of waste stream that makes them better able to oxidize methane and compete with these methanogens in what amounts to a very similar habitat? So I do think there's a lot of room for it and building on you know, how we use them in anaerobic digesters or um, different kinds of wastewater industries as well. We're, using methane cycling microbes has been validated at scale. And although we use it to harvest methane for energy, I think there's a lot of work that can be done to really scale up the methanotroph side of things. Right now, landfills are a source. And so I'm really interested in what ecological controls you can apply to make them a sink. Okay, well, we could chat about that all day, but we better move on <laughs> to uh, my good friend, Wei Ying Lam and her She's going to um, present on some interesting environmental engineers. All right, thanks for the intro, Dave. I'm assuming that everyone can see my screen OK. Yeah, OK, I'm just going to assume that's a yes. <laughs> Um, so today I'm talking about the effects of beaver dams on surface water mercury concentrations in boreal watersheds along a gradient of forest harvest disturbance. So getting right into it, um, studies in the boreal region have shown that created reservoirs and natural wetlands contribute to high levels of the bioaccumulative neurotoxin methylmercury in streams and sediments of downstream water bodies and aquatic organisms. And this is because the conditions that promote methylation of inorganic mercury are low oxygen with high inputs of label, label organic carbon, and that's exactly the environment created by wetlands and reservoirs. And that these water bodies contribute to high methylmercury levels in streams and sediments is so well established in the literature that percent wetland is a default predictor of stream methylmercury uh, with more wetland cover resulting in more methylmercury. So, so much so that a comparable metric I propose was met with criticism from every reviewer of the paper. Um, but if we need to be aware of wetland influences in terms of predicting or managing mercury transport in the boreal region, it's probably a good idea to consider beaver activity also, because beavers essentially create small wetlands that promote the accumulation and subsequent decay of organic matter, which leads to enhanced microbial activity, which is a precursor for uh, mercury methylation. And since the end of the fur trade, the beaver population has rebounded spectacularly, so much so that in 2017, McLean's Magazine ran an article called Canada's Beaver Problem, subheadline, they're causing a lot of trouble and a few cases of panic, which is of course an overreaction, but I digress. Um, so naturally, the increased population and density has resulted in an increase in dams and flooded forest areas that again, favor the production and transfer of methylmercury to downstream water bodies. And although beaver ponds are ubiquitous natural reservoirs in the Canadian boreal region, the impacts of these ponds on stream methylmercury are not well quantified, particularly in areas experiencing forest harvest. So in light of that, um, this study asks, uh, what are the impacts of beaver ponds on stream mercury? So there are existing studies here, but they are relatively few and have the limitations of either extensively sampling relatively few dams or sparse or one-time sampling of many. So there is a bit of a need for clarification in this area. Like are beaver ponds basically just small wetlands or are there ways in which they behave differently? And on top of that, how do landscape factors influence the impact of beaver dams on stream mercury? So in other words, are the impacts of dams the same everywhere? And if not, why not? So to get at these questions, we looked at 10 
active dam sites in northwestern Ontario within about one to two hours drive northeast from Thunder Bay. And these are all a active dams and likely recolonized. So in the literature, it's uh, often thought that the age of the dam or the recolonization status of the dam may impact uh, how it changes mercury flows in that area. But these are all we are relatively confident that these are all active, somewhat new dams that are recolonized. So we are eliminating those uh, potential confounders. These catchments that you see here were delineated from the furthest downstream point of each pond. One of them labeled SF in the middle there is unharvested, while the rest have experienced forest harvest in eight to 30% of their catchment area within the last 10 years. And you'll notice that a few are nested catchments. So Rocky is upstream of W10A, which is upstream of W5.1. And uh, W6 is upstream of D South. So water samples were collected five times between July and October of 2021. It's a little bit of an odd sampling window, but COVID restrictions kind of forced it to be that way. Uh, we took samples upstream, in pond, and downstream at all locations. And this is kind of what came out of it. So you'll see sites here ordered by increasing catchment harvest with the reference site furthest left. So we can see right off the bat that harvest disturbance did not correspond to higher methylmercury concentrations at any of the pond positions. So upstream pond, in pond or downstream. And this is a bit surprising because I expected that the inputs of fresh organic carbon from logging debris would enhance microbial activity and methylmercury production. But it might be that that's only true in the first couple of seasons post-harvest and some of these watersheds experienced their harvest um, five or more years ago. And we see that methylmercury levels were generally comparable with other headwater catchments in the boreal region. So in some of the sites that, for example, uh, Vaughn discussed in his presentation, the methylmercury levels are pretty similar. But what we really want to look at was beaver pond impacts, not standalone uh, methylmercury concentrations. So here we quantified impact as the ratio of downstream methylmercury to upstream mercury. And here we also see that dam impact is not influenced by catchment harvest. Again, the reference site is to the left with increasing harvest as you go right. So while the downstream to upstream ratio is low without much variation in our reference site. There are also sites like Rocky and W5.1 that are similarly low but have experienced harvest disturbance in over a quarter of their catchment areas. So we're also seeing that it doesn't seem to matter whether a dam is downstream of another. So furthest to the right, the two furthest to the right, D South is downstream from W6 and appears to have a lesser impact. Uh, W5.1 is downstream of W10A and also appears to have a lesser impact, but W10A is downstream from Rocky and appears to have a greater impact. So there's not a consensus among the nested catchments, but 5.1 and 10A and D South and W6 are closer pairs. So the potential buffering impact of an upstream dam may be limited by the distance between them. We also, of course, need to address uh, Tastin. There's one large bar here. Uh, it has a much greater impact than any other dam. And this might have to do with the shallowness of the pond, which is visible from aerial imagery. That might make it more prone to changes from wetting and drying cycles, which can, again, promote uh, mercury methylation. So clearly, the impacts of the dams are not the same everywhere. So downstream concentrations are generally between one and four times upstream concentrations, but can be as much as 50 times greater. So what drives these differences? To get at that, we looked at catchment characteristics like the percent of open water, percent wetland, uh, percent cover by coniferous versus deciduous trees, uh, channel length as defined by the most downstream point of the pond, uh, the mean watershed slope and mean annual flow, again, measured at the furthest downstream point. And we also looked at pond characteristics like uh, pond area, the percent pond shed. So this is the percent of the watershed that drains directly into the pond, which is the watershed delineated from the downstream point minus that of the upstream point. 
um, the ratio of perimeter to area, so which tells us about the shape of the pond. Is it long and skinny or is it more rounded? And the percent of in-pond vegetation cover. And we took a backwards stepwise regression approach to find the most parsimonious model for predicting dam impact. And it turned out to only include catchment characteristics. So pond characteristics uh, did not prove to be significant predictors of pond impact on methylmercury. So the four regressors uh, were channel length, mean flow, mean slope, and percent counter for cover. And they're listed by relative importance here, but they were all weighted quite closely. So decreasing channel length led to uh, greater impacts. And we can attribute this to smaller headwater streams having lower upstream concentrations to begin with. So the dams had uh, likely had a greater proportional impact. Sorry. The down to upstream ratios also increased with mean annual flow, which was again estimated from the outlet of the ponds. So in undisturbed streams, mercury export tends to be focused in short episodes of high concentrations and loads. But because beaver dams promote methylation and attenuate fluctuations in flows, mercury export downstream from a dam is more consistent and likely higher than the upstream base flow concentrations. Um, increasing mean watershed slope also led to greater impact and inc increasing slope might promote connectivity of organic upland surface soils, which can be sources of methylmercury to the streams. Um, and this is especially because beaver worn paths like from dragging woody debris uh, tend to be more defined in steeper catchment, again, improving that connectivity. Um, lastly, uh, impact increase with increasing conifer cover. So coniferous needles provide a greater surface area for mercury absorption, resulting in uh, greater mercury inputs via litter fall and dissolved organic matter also leaches more readily from coniferous stands. So associated ponds could experience greater direct influxes of mercury. So some key takeaways from this work, uh, impacts can be very substantial, downstream or upstream ratios can be really substantial, but are highly variable among streams. So previous studies have reported them in a range uh, between two and five times. Here we observe between one and eight times or even greater uh, with individual observations. And models based on landscape metrics generally account for as much or more of the variation in pond impact than models including pond metrics. And that has interesting implications for watershed-based forest management strategies because simply knowing that a dam is present in a particular watershed without knowing the parameters of the dam, which requires a substantial cost in time and effort to establish accurately, uh, is enough to estimate its impact. And understanding the impacts of dams, particularly in the boreal forests where they are uh, abundant, is important for predicting the ultimate effectiveness of management decisions aimed at mitigating mercury risks. So before I close out, I want to respectfully recognize that this work takes place on the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Anishinaabek Nation. It's made possible through NSERC funding and with the help of our partners at McMaster University and the Ministry of Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources, and Forestry. I want to say I got that acronym right, but I'm not sure. Uh, with a special shout out to Haley and Scott, the field techs at the Center for Northern Forest Ecosystem Research for all of their sampling work this past season. So thanks for listening to my talk. Um, I welcome any questions and feel free to get in touch. Thanks, Wei. I think we have time for a quick question before our little break. So does anyone out there have a question for Wei? Hi, I put one in the chat, but uh, oh. I'll just uh, pop on here and ask it instead. Uh, thanks, Wei, that, that's really neat stuff. Um, you mentioned DOC being a possible explanation on why percent conifer would kind of come out as a as an important impact or factor. I just wondered, did you do any water chemistry measurements uh, directly? We did, but I have been um, dealing with a lot of supply struggles in the lab, which I feel like has been happening to a lot of people recently. So I did not have time to work it into today's presentation. <laughs> Okay, so but you'll I be will. able to course you'll be able to look at those correlations when uh, yes, great. I'll send you the paper when it comes out. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay, thanks again. Thanks, Britt.
All right, I think we should move on to our uh, poster session. All right, yeah, so um, in case you missed his poster presentation over the lunch session, uh, Plong Kwong from our research group at UTSC is going to give a quick rundown of his poster now. Um, hello, everyone. Oh, sorry. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm happy to have this opportunity to introduce um, my PhD work, the effect of the forest harvesting on the mercury methylation, on the uh, mercury methylation and methylmercury demethylation in the Canadian forest, forest soil and sediment. And the mercury, including the most toxic form, methylmercury, is a biocumulative neurotoxin that can threaten the human and wildlife health. For example, uh, through the consumption of the impacted fish and the transformation of inorganic mercury to methylmercury um, is primarily occurred uh, microbially in the anoxic environment, such as in the flooded soil and stream sediment. And the forest ecosystems receive a good amount of um, wet and dry deposited mercury from the air, and that can be trapped in the soil, but is subjected to remobilize, uh, remobilization and transformation when the forests are harvested. Um, however, the harvesting activities can lead to inconsistent, sometimes opposite impact on the mercury cycling. And the explicit mechanisms behind the impacts are not fully understood. Thus, these this studies try to investigate um, the impacts of the forest operations on the total mercury and methylmercury concentration, as well as the mercury methylation and methylmercury demethylation potential rate constants in the borrow forest soils. Um, the site, our study site is located in, is in Dryden, which is located in the Northwestern Ontario. Um, Dryden area has a good area of managed crown forest that can be harvested. So the impact of a harvesting activity on the mercury in that area is under press. And in the, for the study side, we have four harvested side and then, in, and then two unharvested reference forests. The samples from these sites were collected both from pre-harvesting and post-harvesting then the co collected intact soil and sediment cores were incubated using enriched mercury isotopes to determine the mercury methylation and methylmercury demethylation. Um, the first two centimeter of the organic zone layer in the soils and then uppermost two centimeter of sediment were analyzed for the uh, K-meth and K-D-meth. So to determine the differences between the samples from pre-harvesting and samples from post-harvesting, um, we use the one-way encoder to analyze the difference after we consider the randomized shifts between different years. Okay. So <clears throat> the data from so we, we have data from 2020 and 2021, but only the sample from 2020 is analyzed. So the data from 2020 show that in the forest CF2, and CF2 has a significantly smaller uh, vegetative buffer zone between the harvested area and the stream. So you, if you can see this um, photo, you can see this is the harvested area, and this is the stream, and this is the only the, two to three meters of buffer zone. And in the CF2, what, uh, because of the significantly smaller vegetative buffer zone, the impact of the harvesting on the stream sediment mercury cycling is significant. The total mercury and methylmercury concentration and the methylmercury percentage, including the mercury methylation potentials, were all elevated in the stream sediment. But in the riparian soil, 
the mathematical content is lower as compared to the reference and harvested forest. But in the upland soil, although we didn't observe the increased mercury concentration, but we did observe the increased mercury methylation potentials in the upland soil. In CF1 water, uh, the difference between the CF1 and CF2 is in CF1, we, there is a regular vegetative buffer zone between the harvested area and the stream. So in, because of this, the stream sediment, we only observed the methylmercury percentage increase. We didn't observe the methylmercury concentration and uh, mercury methylation potentials have a significant increase. But same as the CF2 watershed in the riparian soil, the total mercury, methylmercury concentration and methylmercury percentage were all lower as compared to the reference site. In the upland soil, we also observed uh, an increased mercury methylation potential. Okay, so what this is just for CF, CF watershed. In the Dryden watershed, which uh, has a larger riparian wetland area, we see a uh, way less impacts from the forest harvesting on the stream sediment mercury cycling. We didn't observe any increases in methylmercury concentration methylmercury percentage and uh, mercury methylation potentials across all Dryden watersheds. We, in Dryden 2 watershed though, we only observed total mercury concentration decrease in the stream sediment. In the wetland soil, we observed the methylmercury concentration and methylmercury percentage increased. In uh, the harvested activities, impact on Dryden 1 is even less. We only observed the decreased total mercury concentration and increased methylmercury percentage in the upland soil. So this is only the data from the 2020 sample. 2021 samples are to be analyzed shortly. So from this 2020 samples, we can conclude that in the short term, the uh, impacts of the harvesting activities on the stream sediment mercury cycling mostly occurs in areas where the machinery damage is very close to the stream. So in this case is the, where the harvested area is very close to the stream sediment. And two, um, the larger riparian wetland area such as the Dryden watership in our study have much less impact from the harvesting on the stream sediment, at least in the short term. So, so here um, in the discussion session, I didn't have a chance to thank our colleagues. So I here I would like to thank our colleagues for their uh, assistance in the field sampling and laboratory uh, analysis. We also thank um, the answer for financially support this work. Yeah, thank you. Hopefully it's not too long. No, Plonk, that was great. We have two minutes for questions. If anyone would like to ask Plonk or one of the spe uh, previous speakers, if they ran out of time. I have a question for Vaughn, if he's still around. Yeah. All right. Uh, so you talked about light penetrating, um, you know, prevention by this organic matter did you find any effects of the um like uh, of that from the logged catchments so we didn't actually look specifically at the ecological implications of having uh, less light penetration but generally because there's more doc that resembled aromatic carbon you could just visibly see that those regions were generally darker. Those streams got a bit darker by comparison. And those darker bodies of carbon can absorb those harmful UV light rays more efficiently. So more efficiently. So to answer your question, no, we didn't look at the ecological consequences, but uh, there's, a, there's a visual and chemical signature that suggests that. All right. Thanks. All right. So... 
we'll get on to our next talk and our next speaker will be Baswari Mazumba and she is from the uh, Watershed Hydrology Research Group at Toronto Metropolitan University. So take it away, Baswari. Thanks for that intro uh, so much. And it's great to be here. Uh, just want to note that uh, I'm at a recently renamed university, which was formerly known as Ryerson University, now recently renamed as Toronto Metropolitan University. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, salt in streams today from uh, winter salt to a process-based integrated watershed model for urban stream chloride using the stormwater management model uh, called, uh, called SWIM, uh, better known as SWIM. And uh, I know we're in good company here with mostly fellow Canadians. Um, you'd understand when I say we only have one season up here that matters that dominates our year. And uh, because we spent so much time in our long winters salting um, our roads and all other impervious surfaces, it's no wonder really that we are constantly increasing uh, the salinization in our streams, rivers, and lakes, and uh, bringing in irreparable damage to the freshwater ecosystems there that are largely intolerant to such high levels of chloride. This is more critical for um, rapidly urbanizing areas uh, with uh, rapid increases in roads and impervious surfaces. In these areas, we often see really high levels of chloride um, in streams throughout the year, even in summer, showing um, evidence of long-term retention uh, within these watersheds. Uh, this, particularly, uh, this is particularly relevant in Southern Ontario. Uh, this large figure here is from a study we did last year. Um, urban growth as percent increase is shown here in the darker shades of black in these watersheds. So these areas here in the south um, has seen more rapid urban growth in the last few decades. And this was followed by increasing rates of chloride shown here in these uh, little red upward triangles. While we generally saw uh, decreases shown in blue downward triangles up here, uh, in the areas that didn't face much, um, much urbanization. And because of this, uh, although winter salts are applied for public safety concerns, there's a growing interest now uh, in a lot of cities for salt management plans. That said though, another thing we found in that study is that while we have land use and management on one side, uh, there are also factors that we don't have any immediate control over like climate change or uh, natural or legacy chloride from old land uses stored in the soil and groundwater that keep contributing to stream chloride in time um, and uh, can still have a wide influence on chloride levels. So if we think about it as water quality changing along uh, three dimensions in time with the, within a watershed, there would be land use on one side, uh, for example, urban growth, uh, climate change, usually that manifests in uh, long-term changes in stream flow and watershed management, things like stormwater management or uh, salt application rates, for example. And uh, we would need models that can integrate hydrological processes uh, with water quality, accounting for things like flow, uh, groundwater conditions, and simulate chloride as um, a concentration time series or overall loads uh, responding to different scenarios of change uh, in these different dimensions. Uh, these models for winter salts are extremely rare right now, and we don't much see such models being easily implemented in the early stages of urban planning or for watershed management decision support. Uh, they often actually fail to even initiate because models are generally thought to be uh, data exhaustive or time consuming and uh, usually require specialized modeling expertise. So the goal here was to set up an integrated continuous process model for simulating these scenarios and also address some of these limitations in data time and expertise. The first step towards that is uh, to of course use an existing model software so we don't have to de develop one. 
Uh, we used SWIM by the US Environmental Protection Agency, uh, the US EPA, because it's widely used in these parts and very well documented. It runs on a freely available open source engine with an option to buy a user-friendly interface that doesn't require any um, coding expertise. Uh, SWIM is also uh, known to perform relatively well with minimal parameterization or uh, little to no calibration um, that is out of the currently available free model platforms. And another big consideration here was that uh, SWIM can model snow melt from precipitation and temperature. Uh, and it uh, incorporates all the major hydrological processes like uh, infiltration, evaporation. Uh, you can also model urban drainage uh, through hydraulics, which is very useful if you have that kind of data, uh, although we didn't end up using it in this case. And you can basically add water quality inputs to uh, a lot of these components anywhere where you see a letter C in this schematic. For instance, I used the buildup washoff uh, equation for chloride uh, from all the roads and another for all other impervious surfaces and then routed them to the streams. I also added a groundwater concentration. A major limitation in SWIM though is that you can only route water to soil uh, uh, and water to soil and groundwater with infiltration, but not water quality. So the chloride loss to groundwater um, after infiltration is seen as a loss and uh, you have to um, change the groundwater concentration separately if you want to represent a change in conditions there. Uh, you can also add chloride inputs from other sources if you have that data using direct flows or other programs. And we set up that model for Etobicoke Creek um, that drains directly into Lake Ontario. Uh, the southern part of this watershed is heavily urbanized with uh, busy cities like Toronto, Mississauga, and uh, the International Airport just around here. The headwaters in the north uh, mostly contains natural and agricultural areas right now, but there's significant urban growth plan for these parts. Uh, these are identified in a watershed plan by the uh, Toronto Region Conservation Authority, TRCA. And uh, those urban expansion plans actually include uh, the Greater Toronto, uh, the GTA West Corridor, um, a 400 series highway connecting the Greater Toronto area here in Caledon. So uh, for model inputs and calibration, we use uh, mostly all open data available from provincial and regional monitoring. And spatial inputs like land use, soil, and elevation maps uh, are also readily available through open data these days. Uh, through these, we were able to model um, a total of 129 stream segments to form the whole drain, uh, to form the whole drainage network and 18 subcatchment areas for tributaries. Here's a quick look at the overall model results uh, for the current conditions using land use from uh, 2017 and 2020 climate uh, rainfall and modeled snow depths are shown at the top and bottom with the modeled and observed stream flow and stream flow right in the middle two graphs here. Uh, the 2020 calibration produced fairly well Nash Sutcliffe error or NSE scores. Uh, these are widely used in evaluating models performance in general. Uh, what SWIM uses for its own performance weighting uh, is based on integral square errors or ISD scores. So it rates them as poor, fair, good, or excellent based on those scores. A quick validation with uh, 2017 climate also showed fairly reasonable results. But one big limitation here is that through just using open data, we don't often get to compare with any continuous chloride observations. Usually that comes from more specific local monitoring programs. So uh, those black bars that you see over there for chloride observations are just discrete monthly graph samples that don't represent events very well. And to make up for that, uh, there are a number of other ways you can validate the model by looking at um, diagnostic or hydrological signatures, like comparing mean flow, overall concentration discharge or CQ relationships, uh, load estimates, both seasonal and annual, et cetera. We also compared um, the model of concentrations with a statistical model, uh, WRTDS, 
or weighted regression from time discharge and uh, season model um, that can be that that can be used to estimate daily chloride from daily flow and monthly chloride. So that's this first figure here, uh, and what we saw was that um, we were capturing the general seasonality uh, pattern that WRTDS was showing, but the statistical model produces much more damped signals, probably because of that nature of the discrete graph samples it was using to form those estimates. So uh, in SWIM, uh, the model actually shows uh, something closer to what we see in reality if we have continuous sensors. And that's this next figure here. Usually it's ideal to uh, calibrate a continuous model with high frequency data first like this, uh, but we didn't have enough of that data at, that at the time. And I really wanted to make a model that you can calibrate with just uh, open data and minimal parameters, and then validate it with high frequency 15 minute connectivity data to see how that performs, mainly to address those limitations in data time and expertise that I was talking about earlier. Uh, this ended up not producing great NSC scores, but it still scored excellent on SWIM's own rating. Uh, which is considered most suitable for planning and design purposes. So it serves our purposes, hopefully. Uh, but now to model change, uh, we have to look at land use as well. So to compare with the current conditions model with the recent past, we just changed the climate to 2015 and used land use from around 2012 without making any other changes. So for this validation, um, the overall flow score was again rated excellent, showing that the watershed conditions were reasonably represented. Just looking at these few years of difference gives us an idea of what to expect when say um, changes occur in all these different dimensions. So these are from the model for changes uh, occurring from 2015 to 2020 uh, for that matter. Total impervious uh, surfaces increased by 63% in the model, infiltration went down uh, around 11%. And overall, the chloride loads went up by 36,000 tons or 57%. Again, this is just from very recent changes in land use and climate with no change in management scenarios uh, considered like stormwater retention levels or uh, differences in build up wash off uh, parameters for salt. Uh, nothing changing in there, just the climate and land use. And the idea behind a watershed model like this is that these numbers are not always straightforward. Uh, changes in stream concentrations does not always concur with immediate changes in land use. For example, these are stream concentration changes overlaid on the percent increase in imperviousness. Um, and we can see there are over 10, 20 fold uh, percent increases in chloride in certain spots but not always on the subcatchments with the highest urban growth. So it's extremely useful to study these um, different periods and scenarios of change to see how these factors play together or individually so we can have uh, well-informed salt management and mitigation plans. And that's all from me. Thanks everyone. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, throughout the session or over emails if you prefer that. Thanks again. Thanks for that presentation, Baslani. Uh, if, if anyone has questions, feel free to pop them in the chat or unmute yourselves. And I'm not seeing any in the chat yet. So I have a question for you, B. Um, you mentioned early on um, when you were presenting the model that there's a limitation of infiltration of groundwater and how that uh, was not like an accurate representation of chloride movement. So if that was, if that were to be rectified, how do you think it would change your results? Um, I think one workaround for that, and this is still uh, under discussion, is to just look at uh, trends in groundwater chloride, which are now uh, mostly available uh, from other trend studies, um, and then changing those concentrations those constant concentrations from ground or coming in uh, manually over different scenarios, uh, depending on the timeline that you're looking at. Um, and hopefully that gives us a sense of the amount of change 
that we, we would be looking at in base flow, uh, base flow conditions, but still it's, it's a gray area, I think, for modeling. Uh, it's always a, a gray area for when you're trying to model um, surface, trying to link surface models with uh, hydrogeological models, I think. For sure. Thanks for um, your discussion again, so your presentation again, Baslati. If anyone has questions, again, feel free to put them in the chat. But so we stay on time, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, the wonderful David McLaughlin, presenting his talk on demystifying mercury geochemistry in contaminated soil groundwater systems uh, with complementary mercury stable isotope concentration and speciation analyses. Okay, thank you so much, Wei. Uh, so with that, I mean, you've introduced my talk, so thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, so my, I, I worked on this project while I was doing a postdoc in Germany at the Technical University of Braunschweig, and we also worked uh, in collaboration with the University of Vienna. Um, so first, I'd like to do a quick land acknowledgement, um, and I'll do that for the lands that I currently live and work on in Toronto, and that they are within Treaty 13. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional lands of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. So I'll do a quick background on mercury. So mercury is a persistent bioaccumulative and toxic contaminant. Some people like to call this PBD. PBT, uh, it's, a, it's a potent neurotoxin, particularly in the methylmercury form that Wei introduced us to previously. Um, but the, the global distribution primarily occurs in the atmosphere, but it can also, uh, the hydrological systems are also a significant contributor to this. So in, in the atmosphere, we have um, gaseous elemental mercury it dominates because uh, mercury zero or, or elemental mercury is highly volatile and can easily escape from uh, the condensed phases into the atmosphere. Um, it's the dominant form and the form that we, we see most of the re global redistribution of, of mercury. Um, mercury two plus also occurs, but it's um, more reactive and less volatile and deposits closer to the sources. Um, in the lithosphere, hydrosphere, and biosphere, um, we have these same um, transfers between uh, oxidized and reduced um, states. Mercury zero, is, as I said, was, is prone to emissions to the atmosphere, and mercury two plus is more stable, generally more stable in these um, in these spheres. But this depends a lot on the species, and this is where we get to methyl mercury. Um, and it's, as I said, the most uh, toxic and bioaccumulative form. And it's a, generally a byproduct of um, certain microbial reactions. So with that, I'm gonna move on to my uh, study site here. Um, and this is in the, um, just adjacent to the Black Forest in, um, in Germany. Right, uh, and it's, um, this site was used for what's known as um, kyanization. And this was a treatment of timber basically with mercuric chloride solution. And this um, solution, these, these basically the, the timber was basically soaked in baths of this solution to stop them from decaying. And you can see here, this is um, John Howard Kyan's um, patent from way back in 1832. And it's basically to prevent this from happening. And it was quite good at that, but obviously, you know, having this amount of um, mercury chloride in our soil and groundwater system led to some quite substantial problems in the, in the current day. And at this site, there was around 20 tons of mercury released to the soil and groundwater in this kind of 60 years of its operation. And so you can see here, this is the, um, the kind of facility where this was occurring. And this is our groundwater flow at the site. So this is kind of an estimate of the plume of groundwater that we see in this area. Um, so the methods that we use, we use a, a number of methods to kind of better understand the mercury biogeochemistry going on at this site and, and to try and help us understand how this works um, in application to other areas as well. So first and foremost, of course, we used um, a total mercury concentration. We did this by um, digestion and atomic fluorescence uh, spectrometry. 
the big kind of part of this where we advanced the research the most was the use of stable mercury isotopes. And so for mercury, there are seven stable isotopes. So you can see them here. And this is increasing in mass this way. And what this, what we can do with these um, stable isotopes of mercury is we can do two potential things, really. The first is potentially, I keep emphasizing potentially because I'm going to describe that later, um, source characterization, but also um, process characterization. And this is really what I want to, I'm going to focus on more in the later part of this talk. But we, we, to do this, we um, can use mass dependent fractionation and mass independent fractionation. And the reason I have this crossed out here is because we're dealing with subsurface environments. And most of the um, processes that induce um, mass independent fractionation of um, mercury stable isotopes are um, to do with photochemistry. And because we're under the ground, we don't have a lot of photochemistry going on. So we're going to stick to the mass dependent fractionation. And the, what that basically means, what you need to understand for that is basically uh, the lighter isotopes move faster, they diffuse faster, they react more, and they change phase for more. So they end up in the products more favorably than um, the heavier isotopes. We also did some um, speciation analysis and we did sequential extraction procedures, but I'm not going to get into that in a lot of details today. Um, the other this is speciation we looked at is um, pyrolytic thermal desorption. And that's basically just heating up a sample and at different um, temperatures, we get releases of different um, species of mercury. And this is a whole bunch of prepared standards and how they look. So this is what mercury zero looks like. So it always comes out first in the samples. And this is um, kind of cinnabar in this area here. And you can see these species vary a little bit, but this area, we get a lot of overlap and this is where it gets a bit challenging to just uh, to differentiate these different species. And, and really the fact that we can't identify a lot of the mercury two plus species is, is a big reason why um, we have a lot, uh, some challenges in understanding mercury biogeochemistry. So first I'm gonna look at um, source tracing at this site. So this is quite a complicated diagram. So there's a lot going on. There's a, I did a lot in this study. Uh, so these are our concentrations here. These are our pyrolytic thermal desorptions. This is our um, sequential extraction procedures, but we're not going to look at those. And then the next thing is the dotted line, which represents our mass dependent isotope. And that's the other big one we're going to look at here. This is from our we did isotopes on the sequential extractions, but I'm not going to talk about that for time. And these here, these show us that we have uh, elemental mercury in our, um, in our solid phase samples. So at this particular location, we have this lo loss layer, which is um, poorly permeable and kind of prevents a lot of infiltration uh, into the aquifer, which is marked by this area here. So, to do this, we really need to understand what the actual source of mercury is. What is this, the actual isotopic signature of that mercury? So is it the, um, the mean signature of the solid phase materials that we hear, see here? And that would be the mean of these. Or is it the mean cinnabar ore from European mines that have been used over time? And that would be here. The big issue with that is like that, that this value alone wouldn't account for the variability of these sources, which you can see is quite large. So did also, did the, the mercury used at this site change over time? Did it come from different sources over time? And that's a, another valid question. And have the processes that have been occurring, the biogeochemical process that occurred at that site, um, basically shifted away from that signature? And really the, the sorption of um, soluble mercury uh, chloride to the solid phase would enrich the solid phase in lighter isotopes. And that's gonna get onto this process tracing. So really, um, if the cinnabar ore is enriched in these lighter isotopes, okay? So that, that's our, um, uh, what we're finding uh, here. So this is, remember, this is a negative value. So this is Delta 202 is a heavier isotope. So if we're going negative, we're getting lighter. If we're going positive, we're getting heavier. Um, how can we determine that our soluble, so our, the, the mercury chloride in the liquid phase um, 
it is enriched in heavier isotopes? And the answer to that is blowing in the wind. So th this is kind of a little um, estimation of what this is, is occurring at the site. So we have this mercuric chloride in, so in solution, and these are our kind of logs that are being treated. So we have solar radiation, and that can convert this to uh, reduce the mercuric chloride back to mercury zero. And then that can volatilize away. And if that both of these processes are occurring, we're losing lighter isotopes to the atmosphere. Oh. Okay, thanks, Ray. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so, and then what that is going to do is that is going to affect the signature of what's being left behind in the solid phase. And therefore, it's really, really difficult to do source tracing it, um, because of these variable sources and the processes that are occurring. And that's one of the key things that we highlight in the study. Some other things that we found out here. Um, based on processes, uh, here we see um, heavier isotopes in the solid phase at the top of our profile. And really we can associate with this, the, the losses of the light isotopes to the atmosphere. Um, and here I mentioned before that we saw elemental mercury and we can actually see that when we, um, when we wrote over uh, our samples and you can see the accumulation of elemental mercury in these samples. And so the way we saw that, sorry, that was a slight issue with that slide. And this is the pyrolytic thermal desorption. So we're seeing big peaks um, in this area where we would expect really early low temperatures where um, elemental mercury comes out. And you can see that this is a huge concentration. Um, here we're talking about um, PPM, okay? So that, and that's just the mercury zero concentration, the mercury zero fraction of this total um, concentration here. So that's a lot of um, elemental mercury that's being produced in situ. Remember our source is mercury chloride. If we're seeing mercury zero, it's being produced on site. Uh, so I'm just gonna skip through this slide because I'm, I'm running out of time and I wanna get to this. So the big thing here is uh, with this, we're seeing, um, a shift towards uh, the the light the heavier isotopes in the solid phase, which suggests that lighter isotopes are being moved away when we can um, when we infiltrate through this uh, loss layer and into the aquifer, and that's actually what we're seeing as we move further down. Our um, our aquifer samples are slightly heavier than what we saw um, at the at the um, source here. And then when we look at the, the liquid phase samples, so these are liquid phase samples here, um, we're seeing these are our concentrations. And then what we're seeing here is our, um, where our samples are getting enriched um, in heavier isotopes um, here as we move um, further away from the source. So we're at, if we think about it this way, we have um, our, uh, initial isotopes um, in the sample in the liquid phase. And then from that are being removed uh, heavier isotopes, sorry, lighter isotopes as they're sorbed to the solid phase. So when we get mercury being transported further and further away from the source, what we're seeing is we um, our samples are being in the liquid phase are being enriched with um, heavier isotopes. And so with that, I'll quickly conclude that um, we can use the, our mercury stable isotopes for uh, understanding processes, but there is a real struggle here to, um, to do uh, effective uh, source tracing with these um, mercury stable isotopes due to the variability of our actual source and, and the lack of knowledge that we have on that. And so with that, I'd like to thank my funding sources, which uh, NSERC and the German Science Foundation and the Austrian Science Fund, um, uh, lab technicians and uh, our consulting partners. And thank you for listening and take any questions although we're running out of time. <laughs> yeah, we are right at 15 minutes, Dave. Thanks for a great presentation, but it was a lot to cover. Yeah. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. I will stop sharing my screen. 
Okay, and so our next speaker is um, Sepede. Yes, hear. hi. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, we have you. Yeah, and you can see my screen, right? Yep. Okay, okay great. Well, um, hello everyone. My name is uh, Sepide Khecha. I'm a PhD student from um, University of Alberta, a Water Science and Modeling Laboratory. And I work on the water food challenges in, at regional scale and specifically um, managing the nutrient export and crop production in agricultural watersheds of Canadian prairies. Well, um, due to the growing population and food demand, along with the uh, limited and kind of depleted resources, which is distributed unevenly across different regions and countries, ritual water trade was introduced, um, which is the trade of commodities and um, crops, food, anything with water, from water abundant regions to water scarce areas, uh, which would lead to global water saving. What is neglected is the effect of these agricultural activities, intensive crop production, in the exporting regions um, on the natural resources, which called agricultural footprint. So the population is growing, the food demand is growing, uh, resources are depleted. So we need to find some alternative and um, more sustainable food production approaches. Um, what is the agricultural water footprint specifically? Well, adding nutrients, specifically phosphorus, to the cropping system, for example, in shape of fertilizer, manure applications, which are called anthropogenic sources, and they are necessary for crop growth and increase the crop yields. Uh, however, they can form insoluble minerals, and um, which is less available for crops to uptake, which is called the fixing capacity. So they can be accumulated in the soil and they uh, can be transported in runoff water in the dissolved form or the particulate form, which is attached to the sediments. Uh, or if they can leach to the subsurface groundwater and finally find its way to the waterways and water bodies and uh, the eutrophication might happen. Large evidence indicated that by controlling phosphorus in uh, large watersheds, the eutrophication can be mitigated. However, to be able to apply an effective management practices, we need to understand the interaction and feedback relationship between atmospheric, aquatic, and terrestrial ecosystem. Because all of the hydrological and biogeochemical processes in the soil, in the water, in the atmosphere uh, affect the transport of nutrients from terrestrial to aquatic system. Uh, for example, the crop biomass evapotranspiration, the nutrient uptake, they all affect the water balance and nutrient cycling. So we need to consider and quantify this biogeochemical interaction of different ecosystems to be able to achieve our water quality goals. What are the best management practices and how can we manage this uh, nutrient export? Well, uh, we can control the sources of nutrients. We can control the cropping system, managing the drainage system, or uh, having a barrier for nutrient release to water base for lack of vegetated buffer strips. There are other terms used for best management practices, for example, conservation agriculture, climate smart agriculture, regenerative agriculture. Um, they are kind of similar, but they might highlight one aspect more than others. For example, uh, this one focuses on soil uh, more than other aspects. This one focuses on the climate change and release of carbon, but regenerative agriculture between them is all inclusive. It means it considers everything toward having a healthier soil, safer runoff, greater biodiversity, and finally a more resilient system. Between um, regenerative practices, cover cropping can be considered as one of them because um, it, can, it can improve the soil porosity and infiltration and the soil organic matters. It can um, do the nutrient recycling and mitigate the nutrient loss. Uh, it also reduces the soil erosion and fallow periods and spaces. Um, and finally, it can enhance biodiversity and uh, consequently, it prevents the, um, the weed growth and undesirable products. So we can say that it has the potential to improve both water quality 
uh, because of the clean, uh, safe, safe runoff and the crop yield and production by having a more fertile soil. So in this study, I'm exploring the impact of regenerative copper cropping as an alternative food production approach on both phosphorus export and crop yield, agronomic yield at uh, one of the food exporting regions to be able to achieve a trade-off between food production and water quality at a regional scale. The study area that we selected is um, Canadian prairies. It is uh, specifically uh, Nelson River Basin. Uh, it encompasses Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, and part of the US. At in, it provides and exports various commodities from grain to meat. However, we can see the um, nutrient accumulation and eutrophication in receiving water bodies such as Lake Winnipeg. So we can see the agricultural water footprint in this region. Uh, but in addition to that, this study area has some unique characteristics which may, makes it uh, a little bit challenging to study, to understand and to simulate. Well, one of them is the cold climate, the freeze thaw cycles and the snow melt after that, which affects the release of uh, soluble phosphorus and also it increases the uh, soil erosion and uh, transport of particulate phosphorus. Uh, in, in addition to that, it has numerous potholes, which are the land depressions that can trap nutrients and then release it after um, fill and spill process. So it affects the erodibility, phosphorus loss, legacy, and transport, and it makes it difficult to understand. The tool that we selected is soil and water assessment tool, which is a process-based model um, capable of quantifying land, land management practices in a larger scale having a complex watershed and slot cup for calibration and uncertainty analysis. Well, briefly, it uh, needs some climate data, soil map, land use map, digital elevation model, um, land features such as reservoir, lakes, potholes, and we can also introduce the management operations. And then by overlaying the soil and a digital elevation model and land use map, it can produce some um, hydrogen response units and does the calculations uh, on them and produce some output. This model is uh, already built by another student in our lab and hydrologically calibrated. So our work on crop yield calibration and validation, specifically barley, because it's widely cultivated in this area, and then uh, sediment and phosphorus. Uh, calibration. For calibrating barley, I chose some sensitive parameters related to the uh, operation of crops like planting and harvesting date, uh, and then uh, application of fertilizer, tillage practices, uh, parameters uh, that affect the water content of the soil, and other parameters like um, erodibility of the soil, which is really important. Um, we can see that there is a correlation between the observed yield and the simulated yield across the agricultural districts in the study area. Um, and the calibration is from 1996 to 2016. And the years before that, from 1982 to, to 1995, used for validation. I'm still working on sediment and phosphorus calibration because as I said, uh, it's a challenging study area. I chose, uh, I did the sensitive analysis. I chose some parameters and these are the most sensitive parameters related to the routing of sediment, channel erosion, soil erosion, and the contribution of groundwater. Um, I also modified the SWOT source code for our specific study area to allow seasonality in uh, soil erodibility factor. Uh, because in the thawing period, the erodibility uh, might increase. And uh, so the equation that uh, use the erodibility factor for calculating sediment yield um, is um, constant throughout the time. So I made uh, changes in time. Uh, in addition to that, I adjusted uh, some channel uh, sediment parameters that are the most sensitive parameters for sediment uh, estimation. Uh, to be changed by subbasin rather than being uniform throughout the whole watershed. And because, because it's a very uh, large scale study area, more than 1 uh, million square kilometer. So it's important to consider uh, these changes. Regarding phosphorus, I also selected some uh, parameters related to the phosphorus movement in the soil, the uptake 
by plants. Uh, so it also consider about the quality by using qual 2 e model. So uh, some parameters related to the rivers and the contribution of groundwater and also phosphorus settling in the impounded water, like the wetlands and reservoirs. Well, uh, the next step would be uh, completing the calibration and validation of sediment and phosphorus. And then I'm gonna apply, uh, analyze the effect of regenerative uh, cover cropping uh, on the phosphorus export and crop yield. And yeah, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Spady. Very on time. <laughs> yeah, very, you got well, actually a bit of time. So, um, yeah, we can take some questions if there's any questions from the audience. We can maybe use this time for questions for any of the speakers as well. Way? Um, I have a question for both you, Dave, and Safi Day. Um, one of the reasons this uh, session's title was so long is because we really wanted to work in the implications for watershed management. So if you were to summarize, you know, the main implications from your findings uh, for watershed management, what would those be? Um, do you want to go first? <laughs> uh, well, I'm still working on, I don't have much results. I would say that um, it's pretty challenging for managing a watershed rather than a field scale study. So I'm still working on the uh, on my calibration and validation. So I cannot say much, <laughs> but maybe. If you took a guess for like what you expected the outcome to be. Well, um, I know I'm putting you on the said, spot a little yeah, bit. <laughs> yeah, those practices has the potential to uh, improve the situation. The practices, the best management practices uh, that I'm gonna apply is uh, actually multidisciplinary subject. So I wanna consider different things. Um, but yeah, I hope that it has a positive effect on both water quality and uh, crop yield. Um, Thanks, for, for my study, uh, obviously exfiltration to the um, river systems is a, is a big issue and um, there was actually, we actually did two sites. So this one, uh, uh, what we've seen is the, the plume is actually quite stationary now. It's, a, it's not transporting. And we think, we think the reason for that is that um, the production of Mercury Zero is actually a, acting as a, a loss from the system. So it's, a, it's kind of stalling the movement of mercuric chloride around along the, along the um, groundwater because of um, this in situ reduction and then loss to the, the gas phase of um, the soil uh, profile and, and groundwater wells and things like that. We've actually measured outgassing from the groundwater wells. But at the other site, which is right up in the high black forest, um, there's a lot more exfiltration. And then we have another study that's looking at um, sediment transport of, of that exfiltrated mercury. And um, again, using stable isotopes to determine how that's um, moving along these systems. And, and as we uh, look at different streams inputting, they're, they're changing the organic matter quality, which actually has effect, uh, quite a significant effect on that transport as well. Uh, Kenjiro, maybe you have some questions. <laughs> Have a couple of minutes. Yeah, <laughs> actually, I've been chatting <laughs> <laughs> about the salt, road salt stuff. You know, we, we have an interest in air quality simulation for the chlorine in the urban region because road salt can be, you know, lofted up by the wind afterwards, or the some of the chloride can be volatilized to impact the air uh, gas phase, air quality chemistry as well. So, so. We do need, uh, you know, uh, some rough estimate for how much road salt will remain on the road and the surrounding surfaces for the air quality simulation. So that uh, the the model, uh, that stream model, uh, may not be really have a major focus on the how much salt will be remaining on the surface of the ground. But uh, if there is any, you know, <laughs> indication you can get from that, maybe that will be really useful for us. 
Yeah, I was just wondering how to find a good workaround for uh, kind of interpreting interpreting that remaining build up amount better, depending on um, you know just uh, by changing the model to a maybe really small event scale model, not not a continuous um, large watershed scale. Uh, maybe do a sub model of a small area and then uh, change it to event scale for. Um, understanding that remaining build up more. Mm -hmm. But another way might be to uh, not calibrate the build up wash off equations like I did for, for watershed scale results, but to actually have a better idea about um, how those build up wash off equations are working for uh, urban urban uh, chloride deposition from like uh, something like salt. Mm -hmm. um, I think you'd need a, either like an event mean concentration method for that to have a better idea about the build-up wash off in this one, but um, I don't see an easy easy workaround for oh, yeah. interpreting that um, in, in, a, in a, I guess, easy way for, for air quality. Just, yeah, so scale is probably different as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we are simulating the model at the two two point five kilometer in the urban scale, and maybe that's not really compatible with your, you know, <laughs> modeling. And so it actually is known to work better for event scale, uh, like uh, for small scale studies. I was kind of pushing it by making it watershed scale and the continuous model uh, at such a large scale, uh, just because it it was the most sensible thing to use in terms of all the other limitations in data time expertise, but um, if you want, you can play around with an event scale, um, uh, you know, with one event or so, uh, and then make a uh, seasonal model out of it to gain some ideas about that remaining build-up uh, result, if, if that makes sense. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for presenting and um and all the great questions and discussion. It was a really good session. Maybe Wei has something to say? No, nope, that was all the summary that I was going to say, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, enjoy the rest of the conference and have a good weekend, everyone. <laughs>